And don't hesitate to mute either at times. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Go ahead, Ms. Holdash. All right, thanks. It looks like we're live. So, um, hi, everyone. Welcome to our grade four or five virtual transition night um, with a focus on special education um, and how that looks at Wilson Middle School. I'm Peggy Holdash. I'm the transition coordinator and the grade four to five evaluation team leader. Um, and I've been, just by way of background, I've been at uh, this teaching thing for a while now, almost about 20 years. Um, all of it in the middle school level, with the exception of, I think about six years, I taught um, freshmen at high school, but very similar. Those guys are just coming off eighth grade. So um, I am thrilled to be here. I've been in this role now, this is my second year. Um, it's a brand new position because we recognized at Natick that this transition is critical from elementary to middle, and that we wanted that continuity of someone working with you and with your children as they make that leap from fourth to fifth grade. So um, it's a pleasure to be here and um, welcome. Thanks for coming. Becca? <laughs> Becca, you're muted. Well, it wouldn't be a presentation unless we had that statement, right? Um, I'm Becca Komiski. I am the special education coordinator here at Wilson. I'm really happy to be here and to be working with uh, Peggy and Teresa collaboratively on, on the fourth to fifth grade transition for special education. Uh, just a little bit about me. Uh, the special education coordinator position is is a is relatively new in that I'm I'm just at Wilson and I oversee the programming grades five through eight. Um, I work with um, the ETLs evaluation uh, team leaders, at, which are like team chairs for the fifth grade and for the eighth grade. And just a little background, um, I have been a special education teacher for over 17 years. Um, over the last four or five, I've been um, doing more team chair and administrative, special education administration work. Um, and I'm really happy to be here in Natick uh, and um, to be working collaboratively in partnership with you all. Teresa? Great. I also am just going to put something in the chat um, before I introduce myself. So we'd just love to get a sense of how many families we have here tonight. So if you could just type a hello um, so we can get a sense of how many people we're actually speaking to, because the wonky thing about the stream yard is we obviously can't see you. You can only see us. So we'd love to get a sense of who's out there. So we saw that Rebecca um, said hello um, before we got started. But if, if you're watching, uh, type hello in the chat and It'd be good to know. Great. <laughs> hi, Lisa. Hi, Mark. Um, so I am the principal at Wilson, very proud. And uh, this is my seventh year here at Wilson Middle School. I have over 20 years in middle school education. So yes, I am one of those weirdos who loves middle school kids. Um, I have two adolescents um, myself. I have a uh, a son who's going to turn 16 next week. He's a sophomore and a 14 year old eighth grader um, daughter. I uh, live in Framingham, both of them in the Framingham Public Schools. And um, I, so my background is I was a guidance counselor. I also taught Spanish, uh, world language for um, six months and became a vice principal and principal in Framingham. So most of my career was there. Um, and then I transitioned to Natick for the past seven years and have been at Wilson and love it. Um, love every second of it and love um, all of the students and staff there as well. So we um, welcome you here and um, see some familiar names there, uh, mm -hmm. families who may have some students with us already. Thanks for being here and uh, we'll get started. So just so you know the logistics, I know we look like the Brady Bunch here and three of us on the side here. Um, you may see us turn off our camera here and there when we're not uh, presenting. We're gonna kind of tag team on this. Um, certainly Peggy's gonna take most of the lead as she is the evaluation team leader for you know the fourth to fifth grade transition. And uh, we'll talk to each other here and there um, and we'll get things started. I'm gonna be navigating the PowerPoint as well. So if you see me kind of off a little bit, that's what I'm doing, so. 
And um, what we're gonna do uh, is just hold some questions to the end if you don't mind, certainly. And we'll try to manage the chat if you feel like you need to put something ahead of time, but mm -hmm. um, we're gonna try to get through the presentation just, and again, it's not to, we wanna make this interactive, although obviously with you not being us, not being able to see you or hear you, um, we worry that we could be here until 10 o'clock, right? If we start to answer all the questions throughout the presentation, because some of them I feel like you may, they may be answered as we present. So we'll kind of hold them till the end. So feel free to grab a piece of paper and a pen and jot some down and we promise we'll stay on as long as you, you need us to, okay? All right. And hopefully my daughter won't be jumping in on this. So I just, we'll yeah. just keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> So we want to start you off. We want to start you off with just a little flavor and taste of what Wilson Middle School is all about. So this mm -hmm. video was created by fifth grade students two years ago, back in 2019, during their tech um, tech literacy class, which is one of their specials that they will have. And it'll just give you a snapshot of what Wilson's all about. And then I pr promise you, we'll get into like the logistics around the schedule and services and all of that. So sit back and hopefully you'll enjoy. teacher situation because all the teachers here at Wilson have a great learning experience and your kids will really love them. Hi, I'm Miss Olin. I teach fifth grade math and science on team imagination. I just want to say Wilson is the best school. They welcomed me with open arms when I first started here and they welcome every single student with open arms. Hi, I'm Mrs. Anderson. I'm an Ellen Allen history teacher and we love our kids. Hi, I'm Mrs. Marciani and we're so excited to have your students this year. Middle school is a really exciting time. I know it can be scary, but it's an exciting year and a lot will change and they'll grow and they'll have a blast. <laughs> Hello, welcome to the Wilson family. I am Miss Sokol, and I'm here as a teacher of many, many years, as well as a former Wilson parent. Your kids are ready. They're ready for us. They're ready for all the opportunities here at Wilson, and we look forward to seeing them in September. Woohoo! <laughs> Tell your kids. 
kids, no more walking in line. Do you get freedom in Wilson hallways? One sec. There we go. Um, <clears throat> all right, I I love that video because it just really reflects I the vibe at Wilson. And uh, I was a seventh grade teacher there for Teresa. Was it four years before I took this mm -hmm. uh, role? And it just really does. It's just a really positive atmosphere. And uh, I think that you did a great job with that video because it it's true <laughs> to what what it is. Um, so just to kind of frame tonight, our objective here, I want to start at the bottom of that where it says relationships matter, because this is really about beginning our relationship with you guys and your students as they transfer to Wilson, because we're going to be together for the next four years. Um, like it or not, we're going to be together and we're here to support you. And we really just want to open this up by introducing ourselves. Here's the team and giving an overview of what life looks like at Wilson. Um, I've met a bunch of you already in our fourth grade meetings, and I swear everyone gets the same facial expression when I introduce myself and my role and transition, and it looks something like this. <laughs> and we wanna move this to this. So um, well, that's really like a big part of this, the other piece is there are a lot of questions around the special ed delivery service and what's different from elementary to middle. So we're going to cover a lot of that too. Um, but it's really just a broad overview and try to put some, some nerves to rest. So. Next. Can you go to the, okay. Uh, Teresa already talked about this questions if you have questions please i think it's okay to put them in the chat um but at the end we'll have a q a so we can address all those questions too and a bunch of you responded to the survey thanks for that so that we kind of knew where people's heads were going into this um and many of the questions are answered in the comments we're about to make um so i think we're all on the same same wavelength here in terms of what you need to know as we embark on this transition. So, all right, and here's sort of our agenda, um, the key points we're gonna hit on tonight. So first and foremost to kinda, I think Becca referred to this as the thesis of our presentation, which I thought was very academic, I love it. Uh, I'm a former English major, you know. <laughs> Well done. <laughs> um, the continuum of inclusion um, in the middle school, in the least restrictive environment. So we're going to talk about that. Um, next, how are the fourth grade students introduced to Wilson? How are we going to do that? And Teresa is going to have some um, comments on that and how things used to be and what's happening currently. Uh, third would be the significant differences between the fourth and the fifth grade structures. Next, special ed programming at the middle school level. And then finally, the end of year transition process. And by year, I mean the end of this year. What's going to happen in April, May um, and in terms of IEP meetings and students transitioning, and um, how we're going to handle that. So those. Okay. Becca, I believe. Yes. You. This is me. So, I mean, and this is really just a conceptual kind of framework to start the night. And, and this is not specific to Wilson. This is, this is special education um, process and, and, and just sort of the foundational components of, of why, we, why we do what we do in, um, in special education. And we really try and, and have, we look at our students as a, a continuum and we, we believe that the least restrictive environment is the most is the cornerstone of our service delivery and you know inclusion is 
is a, a, a large component of that. So we we strive for that least restrictive and we, we hope to um, give students what they need, meet them where they're at, um, while also helping them get to that that zone that that zone of learning that where they can feel comfortable to make growth, while still simultaneously um, be given the appropriate level of support that they need. Um, and this graphic, I think, is always um, for, if for me. It, it it I resonate with it. It resonates with me, I should say, um, in that you know, not everyone is the same and it's going to be individualized. And as you can see, based on the portrayal in this picture, I mean, we can have all the same services, but some kids may need different things to access and for us to have um, an appropriate service delivery. So, I mean, this is really just something that we all strive for. And um, it's a it's a continual conversation that we bring to the table, and we hope that students um, are included uh, as much as possible with their peers. And peer modeling is really important, um, and for students to learn from each other in the classroom. So last year, we I'm, I'm just going to say a couple of words about this before I want just one more video. So. Last year, we asked a few of our fifth graders, and this was probably around January, you can tell because there were no masks and, and we're in school. Remember those days? Mm -hmm. uh, so we asked a few of our fifth graders if they'd like to be in a video, and we told them what it was for. We said, parents are really nervous for their kids to come to this school, so please help them feel at ease and let them know how you feel about it. And here's what they said. And these are the things that I like about Wilson. One thing that I like is that um, I made new friends here at Wilson. Another thing that I like is that I have I do science and I get to do cool experiments. Another thing that I like is that I, have, I don't have cubbies anymore and I have lockers now. The most thing that I like here at Wilson is that I made new friends. My, my name is Caroline. I like having laps after lunch. I also like switching classes. Hi, my name is Miles. I, I love Wilson because of Jim. In elementary school, you don't have the option to deal with other kids, but in middle school, they combine them with different classes. And I also like how they give you different lunch options on like elementary school. I hope you like Wilson too. Hi, hi my name is Karen. I think Wilson's great. I like how you're able to get the freedom, like like not walking in lines and being too big in cars. Hope you like Wilson too. <laughs> so take it from the experts. They survive. They actually like it here. Um, Teresa, I think you're going to run us through a typical schedule. Okay. All right, I am, sorry, I was kind of muted there for a second. So I'm just gonna be looking at a different screen so I can see it a little bit bigger. Um, so just if you look at this section here, um, really just to give you what a typical day is. So we run on a six day rotation and one may ask, why not run it just through Monday through Friday? So middle school is a little bit more complicated. We like to offer as many specials um, student special classes to students. So um, many of them run in like a three-day cycle. So that's why we kind of came up with a six-day rotation. So this is a typical day. Let's just say the first day was an A day and then it runs A, B, C, D, E, and then we go to T. We don't have an F day for obvious reasons. Um, but just so you know, the students are, and I'm just going to classify this as a typical um a typical day, meaning pre-COVID, right? So let's just say next year, hopefully things are back to normal and we're able to have all students in and have a full day. Um, students have to be in the building by 7.50. 
Um, that's like the tardy bell, but we um, allow students in the building um, at 735. So that's when the first bell rings. They essentially have 10 minutes to get their belongings, to go to their locker and get settled for the day. Um, we have a 745 bell, which is just essentially a tip, uh, warning bell. And then 750 is when they have to be in homeroom in their seats. We always do the Pledge of Allegiance and um, we have announcements where students, uh, along with one of our vice principals, um, essentially give us, you know, what the day of the cycle is um, and what activities are happening that day. We give, we allow, we let students know what lunch is, um, but students come down to the office and actually do the announcements with the vice, with one of the vice principals. And it's really great. It gives, the students love it. Um, you should see one of our offices. We have sometimes up to 20 students and they all take turns um, reading off announcements about certain clubs that are running after school and things of that sort. So it's a really great start to the day. And essentially the students have four core classes and they all run 50 minutes each. So they have language and literacy, which is, you know, maybe when we were in school, we would call that English class. Um, we call it language and literacy here um, in Native Public Schools. So they have a language and literacy class a science class. Um, we'll go down here to the history class here in like this purplish blue and then math. So those at times will rotate at different times throughout the day, um, depending on what day of the cycle it is. But it's just good for you to know that those classes run every single day. And then here in the white is when students have, oh, sorry, is when students have specials. Sorry, let me get back to that screen. I apologize moved my cursor a little bit too much. Um, so these two bottom areas here, like this one on period three and then period seven is special. So this will be when students have either, they, they're gonna choose band or chorus and uh, they'll also have PE and those run every other day all year. And then the other period, um, they have various specials that run um, by trimester. So we offer um, we offer health, we offer tech, technology education, we offer a tech lit class where the students learn how to type. They also create videos like the one that you saw um, at the beginning of this presentation. They also have art in those classes. They have like a library research class. I mean, there's some really, really great offerings that we have in their schedule. Um, and then this win block here is stands for what I need. So essentially students will go back to their team and that's when they will get what they need. So let's just say that your child was absent for a couple of days. They may, you know, do some makeup work. Um, but certainly, you know, based on what the, what type of services they have on their IEP, this is when the skills development class would run for students. So depending again on what their service delivery is, they may get, you know, um, skills development, you know, with a focus area, maybe in language and literacy or a focus area in math and reading. Um, this is where they would meet with their case manager um, either every day or three times a cycle for those services. So just also so you know, the co-taught classes, which is um, how, you know, it would basically mean, let's just say they had Miss O'Brien, who's a general ed teacher. Um, they may also, that might be a co-taught class with a special educator in there. And that means the special educator is in there for the most part every single day. Um, and those happen during those classes. So the they co-teach, meaning they're teaching together and the special educator, you know, along with the gen ed teacher is providing service to the students on IEPs in that class. Um, and they happen either, they can happen in all classes, depending on, again, your child service delivery, um, but they do happen in these gen ed classes of LNL, science, history, or math. Now, if your child receives services such as speech and language, counseling, physical therapy, occupational therapy, those at, at oftentimes we try to pull students from the wind block. Um, at times, depending on how many services they need, they may, um, we may schedule them during a specials class um, where they may just miss like one out of the six days for a particular class. Um, again, depending on, you know, it, it's not depending on the schedule, it's usually depending on, you know, the child um, and what they need to ensure that we can provide them all the services during the school day. Is there anything I missed there, Peggy or Becca, that you wanted to add? No, because I think we'll get into more specific stuff as we go. But uh, as far as the overview, I think that's what it, it would look like. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the day ends at 2.05. So just so you know, a, a range. So students have to be there at 7.50. Um, the day ends at 2.05. And then, you know, on a 
typical year, we would then provide uh, teachers to stay after school with kids two days a week, which is another great resource. And we do provide late buses for students that need it. Um, and then we also offer an array of extracurricular clubs. So just to kind of get to what the big differences are between fourth and fifth grade, and I will touch, um, I will definitely do do another presentation for all incoming fourth grade families that'll get a little bit more specific about this um, later in the spring. But your child will essentially be assigned to a two teacher team. Um, and we do with a team model in middle schools and many middle schools across the country do this um, really to really try to get to know the student and for teachers to have, um, you know, the same group of students so that they are also, you know, touching base about what the kids need, whether it's social, emotionally or academically. So one teacher will teach math and science and then the other teacher will teach language and literacy and also the history class. Also good for you to know, Wilson's a very large school, uh, for those of you who know it, um, but we have the fifth grade all in one hallway on the first floor, just um, right off the main, the main office and main lobby. We have fifth and sixth grade students housed downstairs and then seventh and eighth grade students are housed upstairs. And we do not really allow like the, up, you know, any grade level to go into the other grade levels um, hallways. And that's not because we're like, they're big, bad, you know, they're going to hurt them or anything. It's really just around space. And we want to ensure that each grade level has their own space um, as well. I already described the home room. That's like their home base. Um, that's their locker will be out right, right outside this classroom. Um, and it's where we take attendance and they hear the morning announcements. Uh, students get lockers for one, you know, for the first time in a long time. So they really love that, um, you know, and they're very small. So, you know, when you come and visit, hopefully um, either this spring or over the summer, um, we will show you that they're very small. So we always tell the kids like you can't be putting a rolling backpack in there um, and you want to make sure, you know, you're not going to be able to put a lot of like other things other than your school supplies in there. Students are responsible for their own materials, so you will get a, um, a list of, you know, school supplies that students need to get. Certainly, if you need help with that, we, we, we will help you with that, but they are, you know, responsible for um, buying their own materials and kind of keeping track of those, and the teachers certainly help a lot with that. The first week of school, they spend a lot of time just in regards to how to organize their binders and how things should be tabbed. So just know we walk them through all of that. The teachers do an exceptional job of that. And I think the thing that, aside from the lockers, the thing that the kids, the students are most excited about is really just around that increased independence. And we do it in waves. So for the first couple of weeks, we're still walking the students to their specials and to lunch more just because we wanna make sure they don't get lost um, and ensure that they know they know, know how to navigate the school, but they get to walk to their classes and their specials on their own. Um, they do change from one classroom to another throughout the day, which is really essential to just getting them up and moving. Um, and again, with that increased independence, um, they get to sit with friends at lunch. They don't have assigned seats um, at Wilson and certainly at, at other middle schools for the most part. We do label the tables for the first week of school or two um, and only by team. So they still have some, you know, they still can sit where they want, but they have to sit at the tables labeled by their team. And this is really just to help them have some um, structure because otherwise it's like a big wide open cafeteria with an entire grade level and they don't even know where to go. Um, it's really proven to work. And uh and like I said, just the after school support that they get and the clubs, um, that's what students are most excited. And I would highly recommend um, just getting your children to, you know, try different activities after school, even if it's something they've never tried before, they can show up. And if they don't like it, they can always just knock on, right? But I think the whole aspect of middle school is to try something you haven't done before and to, you know, find those passions that students may have. So lastly, you know, I touched on this earlier with the schedule. These are the specials that they will have. So they have two periods of specials a day, which is pretty unique um, for our middle school in Natick, um, our middle schools in Natick. I think we offer a lot more of these types of classes than most middle schools, I would say, in the state. Um, but this just gives you a sense of 
what we offer. And this core values class, um, you know, I just want to highlight this one. This is actually taught by their guidance counselor and their guidance counselor that is assigned to them will be their guidance counselor for the four years here. So they will have a guidance counselor assigned to fifth grade and that guidance counselor will not only teach that core values class um, and get to know each and every fifth grade student when they come in, but that guidance counselor will also, you know, really get to know them over the course of four years, which is, you know, definitely an advantage as well. Um, there was a question. I don't know, since we're not overrun with questions, could we take it? Uh, sure. Now, so Carrie, Carrie asked about staying after school. Do the special ed teachers stay after to work with kids on IEPs? And do you need to sign up for those two days? Great, great question. Yeah, so they do. Um, every single teacher is after school. Um, students typically... Um, you know, decide. Most teachers do like to know who's coming ahead of time. And it doesn't have to be like, it just needs to be that day. Um, we at times will schedule certain kids, right? So if a student um, it doesn't come and really needs to come, we will, you know, set up a skit. The teachers will typically set up a schedule and send it to the parents to ensure that the student comes. But, um, you know, we often have like classrooms full of kids with specific teachers and they trade off. So let's just say they're on a two person team with Miss Dubs and Miss O'Brien. And let's just say the special educator attached to that team it happens to be Miss Taylor. Then the three of them typically will coordinate who's going to take who, depending on what they need. So even within the time that they stay after school, they may see multiple teachers within that like 45 to 50 minutes. Um, so the day ends at 2.05 and teachers typically stay until like 2.55, 3 o'clock. Sometimes they stay only for like 20 minutes. So two days they stay until 2.30. And then the other two days they stay until 3 o'clock. And then Fridays, we don't have any extra help because teachers um, leave right after the students do. And this will all be posted um, and was sent out, you know, to you um, this summer. Mm -hmm. Carrie, did that answer your question? Do you have any follow-up questions before we move on to the next slide? Looks like we're good. Okay. <laughs> um, Peggy, I'll just jump in on this a little bit. Awesome. Um, how how long is extra and how long is it? I'm just going to type the answer in the chat. Okay. Go ahead. Great. So, I mean, I, Teresa touched on this as, you know, in the previous slide about the daily schedule and um, the co-top model is, is really about providing service and again, in that least restrictive way in the general education uh, classroom and working with, in a, you know, Synergy is always an, a, a good kind of, uh, we strive for that and we work collaboratively with the general ed teacher to really have um, an integration of content instruction and also any explicit specially designed instruction that, that needs to be delivered in the classroom. And that can look very different depending on, you know, the specific the specific lesson, the specific needs of, of the student, um, but it's having that certified special education teacher work in concert with the general education teacher in, in the content area and um, helping ensure that all the accommodations, any modifications need to be met you know, differently and just assuring those, those pieces um, throughout the uh, classroom. Um, so we have, we have that across content areas and also depending on whatever the services that the, the student may need. Um, if there's, um, for example, in, write, in writing or in reading, um, looking at math, like if there's a, a disability that's related to the math. So there's, it, it really depends on what the needs of the student um, are and how we can best support them but that is that is a model that we use and it is um really nice to get that service built in next to their peers um you know similar peers um typical peers and again having that modeling to help help them grow and, and while getting the support that they need um anything else peggy that you might want to add to that I don't think so. I'm just thinking of what we're used to at the fourth grade and, and how that looks different. But there are often two teachers in the gen ed classroom in the fourth grade 
the special ed teacher and the gen ed. So um, it's very similar to that. I think it's just more scheduled at the at the middle school, but the um, modification and and the teaching is pretty similar. So that's all I would add. Great. And then really just, and Peggy, feel free to jump in on this too. We can kind of talk, cause I know, you know, being a teacher at Wilson, you probably have a lot to share as well, previous teacher at Wilson. So, um, but this really, this uh, is another model that we use um, for uh, students who require um, their reading or math subject matter to be outside of the general education classroom. So, you know, it, lots of different buzzwords that you hear in terms of, of how we describe it, but it, we refer to it as substantially separate or, you know, a Natick term, which you know, I've developed, it's something that we use in Natick is that pull out class. So they're taken out and, and they're taught by a teacher, a special education teacher that's duly certified in the content area. Um, and that really is for a, a smaller percentage of students. Um, and it's it's obviously it's a team decision and it's based on, you know, where that child falls in terms of um, substantially below grade level. Um, we, we really want to see those uh, children uh, as much as possible in the inclusion setting. However, sometimes we, you know, that's where they're at and that's where we have to meet them. Um, but they're accessing um, grade level um, strands and, and content area. It just needs to be targeted um, and modified um, so they can access it. Um, so we, we do, um, and I think that might be similar to what could potentially be, ha is offered at Wilja or Benham. Um, mm -hmm. And Peggy, you can probably speak to that. Yeah, I mean, you you explained it exactly yeah. right, you know, the way it is. Um, the pace is slower and the depth is less than the gen ed classroom. I mean, these classes are designed for students who, they're substantially below the grade level. And so, um, as you said, it's the same strands, but it's just um, more accessible to those students with more significant needs. Um, and I I see it in fourth grade, it's, it's a little different. It's not as clear cut a lot mm -hmm. of times. So there's reading pullout services or there's phonology pullout services. Mm -hmm. And what we're describing here is your LNL class is taught only by a special ed teacher. With a smaller group. And within that, there are skills that are that are targeted, for example, the reading, any type of um, phonological skill, direct instruction. But in addition, you're also getting exposed to the grade level curriculum um, that students in fifth grade are are learning. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of a it's a combo. Right. And they take the MCAS like they're there are um, other pe peers that are in the general education classroom. So, you know, it's just delivered in a different way. Um, I think the other part I'd love to add here is yeah. just, um, cause I think this came up as one of the questions that were, you know, sent to um, Ms. Holdash through the survey. Mm -hmm. The other thing to note is that what, you know, what, again, just to get to some of the differences from elementary is that the kids are traveling from class to class after every period. So, you know, one may want, wonder or worry that like, oh, you know, my son's gonna, or my daughter's gonna get like pulled from that class. And, you know, the kids are gonna be looking at them because they have to go to like a certain class. Well, mm -hmm. you know, they're just going to a different classroom and the kids are going to different classrooms all the time. And the, the you know, any of the um, substantially separate like pull out classes are all within the fifth grade hallway as well. So it's it's not like it doesn't look any different in a sense from a regular from a you know a gen ed class. So it's just important to note that it's not like as if the kids are like marked or Separated labeled. And, yeah. It's um students don't even really know. And even when even in a co taught class in a middle school, I want it and I'm sure it's very similar in fourth grade, like you know, the special educator ends up working with, you know, obviously targeted instruction for the kids that need this, the services, but they, you know, they certainly help any student that needs help in the class and they circulate the class well. And so students 
don't typically know, you know, um, who's on an IEP and who isn't and who needs more services. So I just, yes. that's and really that's important. a really great point to highlight, um, mm -hmm. Teresa, and I'm glad you, you raised that. Um, cause I, it's one of the, I, I joke, like one of the special education classes that should have happened at like the college level is how to be really discreet about yeah. delivering service to save face with the other kids. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, so there's a, a dance that goes on and in middle school that becomes like, um, it's a graduate level course. And, you know, and I really do believe that um, the sensitivity that our, I've, I've observed in our, in our special education and general, ed, like as, as a team, um, it's done very in, in sync with each other and, and, um, um, there's just a lot of fluidity in the in the the roles, and I think that that really helps students feel safe and access what they need and feel comfortable going to either teacher, which I really like to see. Um, so mm -hmm. great, yeah. So want me to move to the next slide? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and. I hope Peggy, feel free to again, same thing. Oh, sure. So this is our so and this is probably what feels and Peggy, jump in because I could be off on this, but I think this might be the a, a more of a shift um, mm -hmm. from elementary to middle school in that there are very discreet pullout um, times for different things within the elementary school. And now we have this 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 is also a, a service outside of the general education classroom that's taught in a small group setting with the special education teacher. But this is during that wind time that we noticed um, and that we that we discussed earlier. Um, and this is really where we focus in and we hone in, in addition to the co-taught and the, the pullout court classes, of course. But this is where we help with that integration piece. And we also help target those um, goal areas related to the student's IEP. Mm -hmm. And often at transition meetings last year, this happened all the time, where a typical fourth grade grid would have five times 30 minutes reading in the C in the C grid. And I'd say, well, they're not in a pullout L and L class. They are getting extra instruction for reading. That would be a skills development situation where we would, and then we talk about how many days we would want to provide that service. Um, right. And that's what we're talking about with the transition meeting and how the grids are kind of tweaked. Um, that it's not <clears throat> it's not a pullout total pullout class for your L and L but it's providing whatever it may be. We often provide phonology if students are still um, receiving that service during this time. Right, so they're accessing a learning center, right? And that's right. sort of that learning center model. And within that, there are, depending on the needs of the student, we try and group according, you know, there's a lot of, of thoughtful planning that, that, go, that goes behind the scenes in terms of like, cohorts and groups and teams and you know we kind of look at that um but at the same point at the same time it's a learning center where there are mini lessons there are are um opportunities to model time management strategies reading comprehension targeted re reading comprehension um lessons some mm -hmm. are connected to the curriculum and some might be something very specific that the teacher's working on it's a combination mm -hmm. um but it's really about what you know what specifically that child needs and what is in the iep So at, at Wilson, um, we really have um, two real, really uh, well, I think well-developed programs have been in, in place for a number of years. Um, one is our academic therapeutic program. Um, and another one is, we call it access. And so for this, uh, for this um, slide, I'll just talk about the academic therapeutic program. Um, and we, uh, this is really for students who, not, I wouldn't say social, they have emotional, an emotional disability. Um, it's, it goes beyond the social emotional 
needs of a typical student or, you know, this is really a targeted program for um, a, a population of small population of students who have emotional disabilities and require a therapeutic setting throughout their day. Um, and, you know, it, again, it acts as a home base for a lot of students. Uh, we have a, a built in uh, a behavior sort of modification positive reinforcement system to help them with self-regulation. They are accessing um, a number of different services throughout their day, and it, it's staffed with a number of different related service providers and paraprofessionals. And um, we really, again, going with that least restrict restrictive model, we have a lot of students that um, really just need help with that emotional regulation and, and can access within the general ed setting. So we try and push that to as much as possible. Um, and we have that through grades five through eight. Um, we have two special education teachers. Um, we also have support from a BCBA, um, consults, uh, psychologist, social worker, um, we have a, a, a lot of um, specialized um, related service providers uh, attached to this program, but also throughout our school. I mean, it's not just about the academic therapeutic program, but it, specifically these students are um, have that as their as their their specific need. Yeah. And I think this goes to one of the questions that was um, uh, in the survey. How are behavior outbursts addressed at the middle school? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's a loaded question <laughs> because it's, we don't have any. Um, and when the teachers do it, we just tell them to go home. No. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I think, I mean, we have a very skilled team um, from the vice principals to Teresa to all of our social workers to our social worker guidance counselors. They're all trained um, very um, in, in safety care training and we there's protocols in place. Um, but in terms of like discipline, I mean, I, there's like so many layers to that. Um, yeah, and we have and we have like a behavior rubric that we follow just to really to keep us um, consistent, right? Um, but to, you know, Becca's point earlier in this presentation around, you know, we um, we really understand that each student needs may need something different, right? So um, it's really important to just note that I don't, you know, I say to this to the students, even I'll say it to them in the spring um, when we visit and all of that too, even if it's virtual this year. I mean, we don't handle, I mean, we're pretty consistent across the district in regards to how we handle students or how handle situations. You know, really the, the goal is to keep it, you know, at the teacher level um, as much as possible. And, you know, every so often we may need to get involved, the admin, um, you know, or a guidance counselor might help a student just better understand if it's something repetitive. But we really try to focus on just each student and what they need and, you know, making it a learning experience. We all can probably, you know, count on maybe more than two hands how many times we've made mistakes when we were growing up and, you know, and how tricky adolescent time is. And I know when they come in fifth grade, they're still not really true adolescents. But, you know, you'll hear me say a lot in my presentation in the spring around talking about that the, those changes that they go through developmentally and mm -hmm. we really pride ourselves on getting to know students and understanding those changes and really just like you know it's okay to make mistakes and it's it's about like ownership and then like you know trying to fix it so that we avoid m more of the same mistakes um i mean their bodies and their brains are going to go through more changes during their these ages than ever in their lifetime, you know, and, it, and that's like a fact. So we expect them to be very up and down and mm -hmm. you may not see it yet um, for your, you know, lovely cherubs in fourth grade, but it will happen um, as they, you know, mature. And it's really hard as a parent to kind of see it and to understand how to handle it um, many times, but we're there for you and we're there for them. And it's, you know, it's very typical and very normal. So we promise that we'll be with you every step of the way. So like generally that's, that's Teresa, you just summed it up beautifully. And then from like a more like academic therapeutic program standpoint that all applies. Um, and, you know, we also, we also want to 
reduce certain levels of of, of non-compliance or any other pieces, but behavior is communication. Um, and we want to try and help the student articulate in, a, in a, a healthy way or in a more positive way what they need. Um, so, I mean, that's fundamentally let, um, what behavior is in, in terms of what that's something that we need to work with that student on. So we don't look at it. Um, it's a, it's, that's why I look at it so, it's such a, a loaded or a layered topic because for me, behavior is communication and I have to figure out why a student um, is making those choices to respond in a certain way. But and so, anyway. there's, so there's a question here that maybe we can just touch on. So do IEPs get adjusted prior to the beginning of the school year? Do you meet in like April or May to discuss the IEP? Peggy, do you want to say that? Jump yes, in that? I do. Yep, because that's me. That's who yep, we do. That's you. Absolutely. So we have a transition meeting in like April or May. And um, we're gonna make tweaks to the IEP. So for example, the five times 30 reading in the C grid would be probably three times four, 35 or 45 skills development, for example. So yes, we'll be going through that. Um, last year, some parents opted for a phone call because there it was a very sort of straightforward um, change, but we'll definitely offer transition meetings. And I'll be, running those meetings with the fourth grade team, translating the IEP to the fifth grade. Great. Do you want to, yeah. So, and just to quickly touch on the access program, um, this uh, the this program is um, really, they, it does a lot of amazing things that throughout our Wilson community and, um, um, our, our vice principal, Niall Carney, is, is really involved in, in some of the um, community-based uh, things that the this student population does. This is really geared for students with um, severe disabilities, um, rain, developmental disabilities, ranging from communication autism, intellectual impairments. Um, and this is really for students that are substantially, substantially below grade level. However, not there are some that we have that participate in inclusion classes um, and they may receive um, a, uh, math and and um, language in a different setting. Uh, a lot of times they're, they're the pervasiveness of this of these student, students with disabilities in the access program require more of that wraparound integrative um, uh, work with the speech and language, uh, OT, uh, PT, and really working on the functional academics and functional communication. Um, and we have two teachers who are, are a part of this program. Um, and we also have uh, many related service providers and behavior technicians and um, paraprofessionals. And they do a lot of cool stuff, and I really miss having this. This um, because of COVID, we haven't been able to do a lot of the community um, activities or pieces that they had a cafe and they did Special Olympics and you know all of these really cool. Uh, they did reverse inclusion where they brought in um, students that worked with worked um, typical students that that worked with them or like played games and so a lot of those things because of covid um we can't do um and so i'm i i loved it because they had a cafe and they delivered they made their own their they had a cart and made their own coffee and we ordered it and it was really awesome i miss getting those coffees um but uh they do a lot of things in in order to build um functional skills and independence and get ready for high school. It's crazy how fast it comes. Not to scare you on that. <laughs> um, I'll jump into this one. Um, so you guys are used to Hannah Cross or Navarre McKaylee and running meetings, the annuals, three years end initials. And so one change um, at Wilson now for annuals, the case manager will chair the meetings. So the um, special ed, case manager that's assigned to your child will be the one running the annuals. Um, I'm always available to be part of an annual for a fifth grader, especially at the beginning of the year, um, when if there are questions or you want another 
sort of set of eyes and hands at the meeting. Doesn't mean you can't have that, but typically the case manager runs the meeting. Um, and then as the fifth grade ETL, I run the initials in the three years um, for the fifth grade. And we always like to say, we can meet at any point. We can always reconvene the team. Um, again, the fall tends to be a bigger or more popular time for that just because of the adjustment period. And maybe um, the maybe your child's making gains quicker than we anticipated, or we need to make some more tweaks or we make a, a placement change. So in addition to the annual, we can always reconvene. That's that. <laughs> And what are we doing about transition now? Um, so right now I'm, I'm running some fourth grade meetings. I'm joining in on some fourth grade meetings. I'm meeting you guys, starting to learn about your children. Um, and I'm communicating with Becca and, and the team over at Wilson regarding the needs of, of your children. So we're gonna be ready for them when they come in the fall. Uh, transition conversations between teachers are in process. Um, the fifth grade teachers are awesome. They, last year it was Thanksgiving and they were like, uh, Peg, when are we gonna start meeting the kids for next year? And I said, it's Thanksgiving, like you have a whole year. And I say that just so you know, they are very tuned in to the needs of your, your kids coming up and they wanna be prepared and they wanna be ready. Um, so they're sort of chomping at the bit to do this as well. They wanna go observe, COVID's kind of changed everything, but we're going to um, do the best we can to make sure that everybody is as familiar as possible with the needs of your kids coming in so we can hit the ground running in the fall. Um, and then that last arrow here on this slide is just what Lisa had asked and I already talked about, about the transition meetings. Great. <clears throat> So this oh, is my so slide, right? This is you. <laughs> yeah. yeah that's you. So um, just so you know, I just want to talk a little bit and feel free to type in some questions if you have any. Um, certainly this is, you know, a unique year. Um, we, with us going um, remote back in March last year, um, we weren't able to do our, um, you know, step up day when all the fourth graders come over to Wilson and meet fifth grade teachers and get a tour. And we even have our chorus and our band like in the auditorium play for them and super exciting. And it's, you know, it's it gets them really pumped up for middle school um, and really feel the school like while it's like in session, you know, um, I don't foresee that that's going to happen this year, obviously. Um, but, you know, you never know. Maybe once we're all vaccinated, things will change. Who knows? Um, but I think as of right now, the plan is just to keep things in, you know, in this hybrid model, most likely for the rest of the school year. Um, but we will, you know, offer things virtually, certainly. Um, so special education teachers and the guidance department does meet with the staff at the elementary level. So we really get to know, you know, your children and um, your students and, you know, figure out what, what they need. And we talk to the teachers around like, you know, placement and things like that. Um, we have pair trainers who are seventh and eighth grade students um, who also typically will travel to the feeder elementary schools and actually meet with students. And, you know, they hear it directly from current students and they can ask them all those questions that they may not feel comfortable asking an adult. Um, so, you know, if we're not able to do that live this year, we will do it virtually um, as well. And students, we've gotten really good feedback from that, um, that as well. As I said, step up days typically in the beginning of June where the students usually come to the school. You know, we'll keep our fingers crossed that that can happen. Um, I just wanna be really honest, I don't foresee that happening this year, but we'll see. Um, and then typically like mid to late May, early June, um, we also have a fourth grade open house night where we invite all of the families from, um, and Kennedy does the same thing where we invite families from the feeder schools and we do, um, you know, basically a presentation similar to today, but all around like what a typical, you know, day is. And it's really encompassing all the aspects of the transition from fourth to fifth grade, not just specifically special ed. So um, we did this last year virtually and, you know, we got some good feedback. We asked that the students attend with their families. We did it through this StreamYard, um, you know, presentation and people asked questions and, um, you know, it, it went relatively well oh, for well. Well, I would say. <laughs> um, well. Thanks, Becca. Um, and then we typically have, 
two days in August. Um, we usually try to do them different weeks in case families are still traveling, you know, on vacation, um, where our PTO and our pair trainers, you know, basically host the two afternoons where students and families are uh, welcome to come. It's basically a drop in. You don't have to schedule it ahead of time. We usually open the school up from like 12 to two and students at that point will already have their schedules and they are, you know, invited to come in and just check the school out, go check out the fifth grade hallway, see where their locker is, see where their home room is um, and just kind of get a sense in preparation. It's usually a week or two before school starts. So again, we weren't able to do that this year. You know, hopefully we'll be able to do that this summer. Um, and then we typically have like a curriculum night um, as well in either late September, early October, where you would be invited to come and meet with your child's teachers and, you know, certainly their case manager um, for them to let you know what the, you know, what the curriculum is for the year. And typically we have some student work out on display um, and it's just a nice meet and greet um, for you and the teachers. And I'll, we typically have the fifth and sixth grade parents on one night and the seventh and eighth on another night, uh, just because parking can be really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> So those are, you know, that's essentially what we have in place. And like I said, I'm, you know, I wish I had clear answers in regards to how much of this is going to be is going to be live. Mm -hmm. um, and until, you know, either the summer or next year, I'd assume that most of it is going to be virtual. And it, and I'll be, and I'll be really frank and honest. I mean, it's been, it's definitely a loss. Uh, you know, I see it in our current fifth graders. Um, probably for the first time in all my time, like I have fifth graders who don't really even know who I am because they only saw me like in a presentation back in May. Certainly they see me in the hallways, but I have a mask on and I'm not as engaged with them like in lunch or in the hallways like we typically would. Um, so just so you also know, we've put some things in place at Wilson this year to really just try to stay connected with students. So we created a student newsletter that I send out to all of the students via email um, every Friday. And it, and it um, typically is like a short little video of me, like just talking to them and, you know, talking about highlights for the following week. I've been highlighting different staff members, like key staff members, like our admin assistants or our vice principals. Um, be careful, Peggy and Becca, you guys might be yeah. next. Um, <laughs> <I'm waiting. laughs> and we display like student work, like, you know, things that students um, created and kids are, students now are always asking me, are you going to put that in the newsletter? And they're like really excited about it. I always ask, certainly. Um, but it's just a way, you know, virtually for them to stay connected and feel connected. So I do feel, you know, the fifth grade has had some of a loss in the sense of like, they're not getting that true experience um, of what will Wilson's really about, but we're, you know, we're always trying to get better. We're here for you. And we certainly want to make the experience the best that it certainly can be. Mm -hmm. I'm just thrilled that we're oh. still open. We're still here and we've lasted this long. I, I don't know about you guys. I'm pleasantly surprised. So. Oh, good. Well, I was just well, reading Angela. Thanks, Angela. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's been it, and I get some I'll get some emails from students. And that's also something just to note, too, that is a big um, not change, but just definitely a big jump. Um, so all of our students starting in fifth grade have e their own email. Um, the good news for you to know is um, if you're hesitant about it, is that five through grades, five through seven parents and out the outside world of Natick PS cannot email them. Okay. So it's only interschool. Um, obviously for obvious reasons. And it's really just so that they can access and share like Google Docs. And, and it's been great because like just this is the first time this year that I've been able to email all of our students at once. Um, so I put them all in a blind CC, I email myself, and then I share certain things. For example, I emailed them today to let them know what the early release schedule would be. Um, same email I sent parents through Blackboard Connect. I sent it to kids um, just so that they also knew, especially for our remote students, so they knew when to log on to their classes. Um, so I'll do that more and more um, as well once your children, you know, transition to us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, we're getting fancy. Good. Look at you, Becca. Love it. You're muted. Sorry, I'm muted though. I can't seem to figure out my mute, but I figured this out. <laughs> um, so is it safe to say that the wind block is going to be their learning center block so that it's 35 minutes of specific IEP service or work? 
Yeah, if that's what they, if I, I believe, yeah, that's the answer is yes, if that's what they call on their IEP. Um, Carrie, just something to note is we are in the process of potentially transitioning our schedule. Um, we're not sure if it's going to happen for the next school year or the school year after, but it actually will become a longer block. So right now our wind block is only 35 minutes, um, but it most likely is going to transition, like I said, either next year or the year after to a 48 minute block. Okay. Um, so your students, your children will have even longer block for those, for that, for that skills development class. Yeah, so the wind block would be dedicated for that skills development class. Um, and then to, to piggyback on your next question, hold on, let me let me put it out. Um, and then in and in all of the other classes, there will be a learning center teacher there to work with students. So, yes, depending on the service of a particular student. I mean, if a, if a student so it, it can vary, it's not like um every student has a co-taught um uh, co-taught on their their service delivery so it, it all depends on what like how things shake out in terms of so i couldn't say like every child would have a learning center teacher in their classroom because it just that it, unless it has to be a service on their iep um and they need to require you know a co-taught model in order to access based on their disability and everything but but in essence like if there is a student that, that ha requires a special education teacher in mm -hmm. their general ed classroom then they would be there in that co-taught model um and it could just be for um you know reading or it could be for writing and it depends on what the needs are across like each class um but th those are questions that you can have at the team level when you meet with peggy and um like flush out those specific nuances of, of service delivery um but this is really like it's not a one size fits all kind of thing um so just to keep that in mind but they will have help, you know, if they, so yes, they will have help. Mm -hmm. I just, I can't answer specific questions about specific skills. Yeah, I, I think the other piece I just wanna make sure um, in case this, I'm not sure if this is what Carrie was intending. I mean, so certainly if the student requires it, they have it. Um, if it's on their IEP, but not every single class has a co-teacher in it, so. Right. You know, That's what I was really, trying to articulate, but I might have not. No, you did. You did. In some in some classes, you know, some classes have a Paris a paraprofessional in there mm -hmm. as opposed to a special educator. But you'll know what your child has, obviously, depending on what their um, service delivery is. And and I think it's just important to note that the gen ed teachers are obviously very trained too to support students and yep. do. And I think that the, the a huge advantage that we have at the middle school level is that we do teachers stay after. And I can't even tell you how, I mean, we have hundreds of kids after school on a typical year who stay after with teachers and then we'll go to like a club, um, an after school extracurricular club. And it's, and it could just be like a very small, simple question. We have constantly have kids coming into the office in previous years, like calling their family to be like, you know, I really want to stay with Miss O'Brien today, um, you know, to finish up my, you know, my reading journal and I was struggling and, and the parent, you know, will say, yes, are you taking the late bus or am I picking you up? And it's a real culture um, at Wilson. Um, I've noticed it's just a culture that is, it's almost, it's just a part of, of what kids do. And it's a great opportunity for them to really hone in on those skills of working with teachers, um, building independence and learning how to ask questions. Um, and, um, and then Carrie, to your point, I completely understand your concern about how much help they will have. And I'm sure, you know, many parents have questions about that just in as you transition, as they transition to a, a new setting. Um, but we really want to just try and ease, ease your worry. And obviously, Peggy is a, a resource and I'm a resource as well. And and also Teresa for just asking some Follow up questions if you have any, and I know Peggy's going to be sending out um, some follow up vehicle to, to to make sure that we circle back and answer any questions you may have. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, I see that uh, Teresa answered the club question. Oh, good. 
Um, I'm really kind of getting into putting this on the front here. So just saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of going to your head. I know a little bit, right? <laughs> no, but that's so, those clubs are just the best, just for that social piece and just to connect school with something you enjoy doing and it's fun and that you're, you're maybe good at that. Um, it's just so great, especially at the middle level. So, um, Didn't they have a bulletin board club this year. I kind of liked that one. That was good. Yeah. A fifth grader created that, um, this year. I think we're just, struggling with how they're going to decorate the bulletin board so <laughs> being socially distant so it's that's something you're yeah. trying to figure out it's a good yeah. idea. so we also have intramurals um you know certain days for certain grade levels um because the fifth graders typically other than yeah they typically can't mm -hmm. do the interscholastic sports um that typically starts in sixth grade with like track or cross country <clears throat> um and then seventh and eighth grade for like basketball and volleyball but um, those are other things that, that will, you know, be available to them. But I, I can't even tell you, like, the coolest part about is that many of the fifth graders come up with, like, their own club that they want to create. And then, you know, they write a proposal to me. I meet with them. They write a proposal. They get, like, basically, a, you know, some friends that are interested in joining. And then they just have to find a staff member to supervise, right? So we always want to make sure we have a staff member that will supervise it after school. And then typically those students will come and do the morning announcements and then, you know, to try to sell it so that other students are interested in the club. And those typically are the ones that, you know, stick. Um, we have a scratch club, which is like a coding club, too. And, you know, that was a, a club that, you um, sixth graders two sixth grade boys um were really interested and it's still running and those boys now are at the high school and they still facilitate it with the help awesome. of the staff member and it has grown from like five kids to now like over 30 students over the years oh. so it's um yeah it's pretty amazing that's cool all right any other questions yeah, there was just one. I know it's getting late, but um, someone had asked about homework, and this comes up a lot. Um, is there homework in fifth grade? Could we just grab? Yeah, yeah there definitely is homework in fifth grade. <laughs> you. Um, you know, we we definitely um, gauge it so that it's not more than a certain amount of time. Um, you know, for students, and obviously each student works at a different pace. So we really ask parents to monitor that. So if your child's spending more than an hour on homework a night, we really say like, okay, just sign off and let's kind of, you know, stop. Uh, you can sign off on it and then, you know, be in touch with the teacher, certainly if um, if they need to. But they, they will have homework. They will, you know, oftentimes not have homework over the weekend. Um, and they don't have homework in every single class because the teachers, you know, like I said, that that's the advantage of having a two person team is you have the same teacher for math and science and then, then the, you know, the same teacher for the LNL and, and history class. And those teachers share the same group of students and they're considered a team. So they're constantly communicating about, OK, let's just try to balance out the tests, you know, so that with the students don't end up with like, you know, three assessments on one day. Um, and balancing when things are due and how to like balance out the projects. Um, but that's, you know, to Peggy's point, I mean, the fifth grade teachers are just like, they're so amazing and they spend so much time early on and throughout the year all around the executive functioning and the organization and, you know, teaching them how to manage their time um, and all of that. So that's part of what we do and what we teach with them, um, teach them in fifth grade. So. It's, it's very rare that a fifth grader will be inundated with homework, but certainly if, if when that does happen and it has happened, um, you know, we just ask that you communicate with the guidance counselor and certainly with the teachers and we will help balance that. Because oftentimes what I found is the students that typically are buried in homework are kind of our, you know, our students that are really struggling to like, you know, put it aside when it's done and really just are working so hard and are going back and trying to like, you know, make it perfect in a sense, which we know doesn't exist mm -hmm. and are just um, over diligent in it. And the teachers really need to help them navigate like, nope, it was fine the first time, like let it go and let's move forward. So, um, you know, and, and we'll learn that about your individual children. Um, mm -hmm as we need. And a lot of times kids will stay home if they want to get some of the work done, you know, when they're getting extra help from a teacher, they may then start some homework at that time as well. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Thanks for addressing that. It, I, it's a great question. Yeah, um, it is. And the kids ask it all the time too. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any anything else that we could address before we wrap up? This is so weird. Just wait. I know. <laughs> um, well, good. Then I think you have our contact info. You, um, If you're here, you got an email from me. So you have my um, email address. So don't hesitate to um, send an email if you need some more information or if you have any questions um, to any of us, actually. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it. Oh, there's Teresa's email. Okay. And uh, I think we're set. Team, unless you want to add anything else, I'll just add mine too, just so. I'm actually adding yours, Becca. Oh. <laughs> I just was like almost there. Okay. okay. Thank you, everyone. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Be in touch. Thank you, everyone. See you next year. <laughs> and I'll see you all soon. <laughs>